Good evening, everybody. My name is Alexander Warber, and I would like to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the EBCP. Today, we have chosen a very interesting topic, which is not probably the main work for most of you. We are talking about organ preservation. This is something that may be of interest for a number of perfusionists, and it is a topic that has expanded a lot in recent years. And we have managed to get some real expert on these topics for tonight. And I'm happy to introduce our first speaker for this evening, which is Stephen Tsui from Papworth, Papworth Hospital in England. And he will kick off the meeting with his presentation on organ preservation. Stephen, please. Thank you. Well, I'm very grateful to Dr. Waba for inviting me to share our experience on this. And I do apologize for not being able to make the December date and uh, have to reschedule. So I'm going to share my slides now. Can everybody see my title slide? Yes. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, I've taken the liberty of adding one word to uh, the, the title of the talk that Dr. Waba asked me to give. So this is a thoracal abdominal normothermic regional perfusion, which is the name of the technique on donation uh, after circulatory determined death. But I'm talking about heart donors because this technique, this TANRP, is a technique that is used largely for uh, DCD heart donors. So, as as Dr. Wabba said, not all of you are involved in transplantation organ uh, preservation. But just to give you some background, heart transplantation is probably one of the most remarkable success and in medicine. And as you all know, this was started by uh, Christian Barnard back in 1967. And over the last uh, 50 or so years, over 150,000 heart transplants have been performed worldwide. And this shows you the um, survival, the median survival of heart transplant through the decades. And in the most recent decade, we can see that the median survival is now 12.5 years. Um, but this doesn't include people who've been transplanted within the last 10 years, and we expect this to increase to around 15 years for the current cohort of patients having heart transplantation. Now, the biggest uh, hurdle with heart transplantation is the shortage of donor organs, and this is the data from the Eurotransplant uh, Registry database, and you can see that the total number of people waiting for a heart transplant is actually more than double the number of people who do receive a transplant every year. So there's a huge shortage of donor hearts. And for those people who've been listed on the Eurotransplant waiting list for heart transplants, after waiting for 36 months, less than 60%, so 58%, only 58% of people who receive a transplant. And um, the rest are still waiting or they've actually died on the waiting list. So there've been numerous strategies to try and increase the number of disease donor hearts that are made available for transplantation. And today we're going to focus on this donation of the circulatory determined death. So some of you will probably be familiar with heart transplantation from brain dead donors, which is largely what everybody has been doing for most of the last 50 years. Um, but there are severe brain injury who do not fulfill the formal brain dead criteria. And uh, unless we have another route for them to donate organs, we're going to deny these people from being organ donors, even though they may have expressed a wish to be a, an organ donor. So. Um, 
this discussion started back in the 80s and 90s, and this is when the first consensus conference on what used to be called non-heart-beating donor or NHBD was started in Maastricht. And this is how the Maastricht classification of these donors came into being in a pu publication in 1995. And over the last 20 or so years, there's been a number of further meetings to refine the definition. And this is the latest Maastricht classification of what is now called donation after circulatory death or DCD donors. And um, the, the hearts are very, very uh, vulnerable to warm ischemia and cold ischemia. We can only at the moment um, benefit from using donors when we can predict or expect them to have a circulatory arrest and death. So these are these somewhat sometimes called controlled DCD donors would be category three, master category three donors. And these are people with um, catastrophic brain injury, but do not fulfill brainstem death criteria. And we have deemed that they should, uh, is it in their best interest to have withdrawal of life sustaining therapy. So this, this life sustaining therapy um, is withdrawn after the treating physicians have declared that further treatment is futile. It's not in the best interest of the patient to continue on this life support. So there is a clear intention to allow the patient to die and not to perform CPR. And this is with the express agreement of families um, to make sure that the family is in agreement that treatment is futile and it's best to let their loved one pass away and die. So the withdrawal of treatment involves withdrawal of all cardiorespiratory support, including inotropes, vasopressors, and removal of the endotracheal tube. And these Patients are then managed in a supine position and they usually have a respiratory rest and then they have a circulatory, cardiocircuitary arrest. So you can see this sort of schematic showing you from the time of withdrawal of life sustaining therapy. But the first thing that happens is that the patients will become apneic, they will stop breathing, and then with the hypoxia, they blood pressure will start to fall and eventually they decrease. There's a mandatory period that we have to wait before we can confirm death. And in most European countries, this is about five minutes. In some countries, it can be as long as 20 minutes. But before the confirmation of death, this is still a patient. There's still legally a patient who is alive. And it's only after the confirmation of death that this person becomes a cadaver or a dead organ donor. And so most of the organ preservation can only be uh, instituted, instigated and started after the confirmation of death. And asystole in this context is mechanical asystole, so loss of pulsatility on the arterial waveform. And most countries will accept that there may be the odd ECG complex beyond mechanical asystole, and that is acceptable. Now, I'm going to go very quickly to talk about uh, the uh, available techniques in managing um, uh, or retrieving these donor hearts. Um, so over the last 15 or so years, there's been quite a little interest in looking at how we could safely protect these asystolic hearts that have suffered a period of warm ischemia during the withdrawal life support, and then five minutes of um, asystole. Um, and the warm ischemia we know is very damaging to the heart. Of course, we can do what we use, usually do for um, brain dead donor hearts, which is cold preservation. Uh, however, the early results have been very disappointing with one year survival of less than 60%. So that's pretty much now abandoned. We can, of course, quickly remove the heart and put it into a machine for warm blood perfusion. Um, that is something which is done more and more. 
But in Cambridge and Papworth, what we have developed is a technique called thoracal abdominal normothermic regional perfusion. So this we feel is the quickest way to restore oxygenated warm blood perfusion to the heart in situ. So with the heart still inside the body of this asystolic donor. So we do a uh, rapid stenotomy incision and after we open the pericardium, we will inject heparin directly into the right atrium as well as the pulmonary artery. Then it involves arterial cannulation and venous cannulation. Now, you in the, in the beginning, when we first started doing this, we used to always cannulate the ascending aorta and the right atrium. But as time has gone on, we find that there are alternatives. And in fact, this is a bit like also do peripheral cannulation using femoral artery and femoral veins, or you can actually do a hybrid. You can do a combination of uh, a central arterial and peripheral venous or vice versa. So there are multiple options of cannulation. But the key to this technique is that we need to uh, respect the requirement for not restoring blood flow to the brain. In most countries that permit this technique of TANRP, there is a requirement to ensure that there is no reperfusion of the brain. So what we do is that we would clamp the three arch branches. So we will clamp the arch branches. And more recently, we actually open these three arteries, this still to the clamp to ensure that there is free flow drainage in case there is any collateral blood that may have gone up to the head and neck vessels. So this is a video which I hope will play um, to demonstrate this technique. Um, I'm afraid it is not playing. What I was hoping to show you is a video of uh, one of the um, real life um, sort of procedure that we, we did in a DCD donor. Uh, so I'll, I'll perhaps just talk through the steps of what we would do. We would do a rapid stenotomy, open to pericardium, and heart, of course the heart would usually be very, very distended and asystolic. We would inject uh, 30,000 units of heparin into right atrium and um, 20,000 units of heparin into the pulmonary artery. So this is a total dose of 50,000 units, which is more than enough for most uh, patients to be on full bypass with no chance of blood clot. Um, we would cannulate the ascending aorta, cannulate the right atrium, clamp the aortic arch branches, and then we can start the uh, uh, extracorporeal circulation. But in this case, um, because the extracorporeal circulation is restricted to the thorax and the abdomen, so the perfusion is not total body, it is only to the regions that we're interested in taking organs from. And, and so this is why, that's why it's called thoracal abdominal normothermic regional perfusion. Um, again, I was hoping to show this video, which unfortunately doesn't play either. Um, but what it, what it means that once we actually go on to this, TANRP, all the organs that are uh, potentially of interest for transplantation are then reperfused. Um, and it allows the abdominal team a rather, what I would say, leisurely approach in dissecting out the, um, the org, abdominal organs. Without TNLP, uh, any of you who is a super rapid technique that everybody are rushing to very quickly perfuse the organ and very quickly excise them to try and limit the warm ischemia. But with TNLP, what we 
do is that we turn the very challenging situation into a very calm and controlled retrieval, very similar to a brain dead donor, because all the organs are actually perfused by the pump, and there is uh, actually recovery of these ischemic organs. And once the heart has recovered function and started beating normally, we would then gradually reduce the flow of the TNLP and eventually wean off TNLP and ventilate the lungs so that there is auto perfusion by these donor hearts, that the heart itself and using the lungs to oxygenate the blood will perfuse the abdominal organs. So in the protocol that we use, um, we would arbitrarily use a uh, TNRP flow rate of five liters per minute. We aim for mean arterial pressure of 50 millimeters of mercury or higher. Uh, if required um, for either cardiac function or a basic constrictive effect, we would use dopamine. But usually we keep it to less than 2.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And that is because we're only perfusing perhaps half the body mass. So uh, if we have a, let's say an 80 kilogram donor and we use a five microgram per kilogram per minute dose, that actually could end up being a quite a high plasma concentration because we're only perfusing half the body mass. So by using the donor body mass and we go for 2.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute, this is equivalent to five micrograms for a total body perfusion. And once the heart is beating, as soon as the heart is beating, we will actually clamp up the venous line and allow some degree of ejection. Uh, because until now, even though we inject heparin into the pulmonary artery, the lungs themselves actually have, would have stasis and there is a risk of thrombus forming within the lungs. So usually within a minute of starting TNLP, the heart would start contracting and beating. And when we see that happen, we would load the right ventricle and build up some blood so that the, the heart, the right ventricle would pump the, the, the heparin through the lungs and wash out the lungs to make sure we don't thrombose the lungs. And then the rest uh, of biochemical uh, management is to make sure that we optimize the condition because after about 30 to 45 minutes of TNLP, when the heart has recovered sufficiently, we would then gradually wean the donor off TNLP, um, aiming for a CVP of six to 10 and let the heart perfuse the rest of the donor. And at that point, we're able to float a swan gans catheter, a pulmonary artery catheter. We can do a transesophageal echocardiogram. And this is how we would normally assess a brain dead donor heart. And because this DCD heart has restored function and beating and no longer a systolic to assess these donor hearts. And the acceptance criteria for a DCD heart um, it's actually exactly the same as our acceptance criteria for a brain dead donor heart. Um, so after TNLP, we want to make sure that we've got a uh, ejection fraction of more than 50%, a filling pressure of 10, uh, 12 or less, and a cardiac index of more than 2.5. Okay. So compared with taking the heart out of the body and put it into machine for perfusion, which on average takes about 26 minutes. If we do uh, in situ perfusion, we can restore blood flow to the heart within a median of about 17 minutes. So there is a saving of about nine minutes of warm ischemic time using this technique compared with taking the heart out and putting it into a machine for perfusion. <laughs> So right now, um, the options for taking for, for retrieving DCD heart is in situ and machine perfusion, or what we do with TNLP, assess the function. And if the function is good, we can take the heart out and put it into machine perfusion for transportation or even just cold ischemic uh, storage for transportation. So all three are possible techniques. Now in the UK, um, 
we were one of the first countries to start uh, TNLP and DCD heart transplant back in 2015. And this is a summary of the UK experience in the first seven years or so. Now all the UK transplant centers are actively uh, doing DCD heart transplants, although only three centers are involved in retrieving um, DCD hearts. So we can see that we've attended 368 uh, patients who underwent withdrawal of life supporting therapy and uh, 224 proceeded to circulatory arrest. Uh, 25 have been put on TNLP and 199 put on machine perfusion. And you can see the yield rate um, at 22 of the TNLP hearts have been successfully uh, transplanted and 170 of the machine perfused heart had been transplanted, which gives us nearly 200 DCD heart transplants in the UK. And this is the survival, 12 month survival of our early first five years of uh, the experience. So the red line is kind of like the control is the number of people who've had uh, brain dead donor heart transplant, the standard heart transplants showing you the one year survival curve. The blue line is the machine perfused DCD hearts, which pretty much overlaps the brain dead donor heart transplant. So you can see that the outcomes of DCD heart transplant using machine perfusion is as good as brain dead donor hearts. So that's very reassuring. But what we're very pleased to see is that the TNLP retrieved DCD hearts, um, even though numbers are small, had 100% survival at both uh, three months and 12 months. So they appear to be better preserved and, and functioning better. And this may well be related to the nine minute shorter ischemic time that, that we allow, we able to, to perfuse the hearts in situ. So NLP is a technique that is already used uh, in, in uh, abdominal DCD organ retrieval. And this is a map across Europe showing you in green all the countries that are currently um, uh, using DCD organs. So including organs for abdominal organs, for liver, kidney, pancreas, and so on. The, um, however, only eight of the countries allow normal thermic regional perfusion. And so far, only three countries in Europe are doing the TA, the thoracal abdominal NLP, and that's UK, Belgium, and Spain. But I'm hoping that more countries will join in and start doing this in the coming years. And uh, in the United States, uh, they started TNLP back in 2020, so only three years ago. And by now, I think there are five centers doing TNLP in the United States. There's some variation in practice across different countries in terms of the uh, regulations of what is allowed and what is not allowed. So UK and the Netherlands are in some ways the most restrictive in that we are not allowed to do anything with these patients until death is confirmed. Uh, Norway, Italy and France are a little bit permissive they do allow it to rest. Um, so this allows uh, circulation and sort of systemic anticoagulation, which is helpful. And in some countries, they're even, like Italy, they're even allowed to place guide wires into femoral vessels uh, before circulatory rest. The most open-minded countries would be Spain and Belgium, where they are actually allowed to do pretty much anything uh, before withdrawal of life support. So they can heparinize, they can fully cannulate and connect up to the uh, ECMO circuit before withdrawing life support. So of course, it means that there is a huge advantage in saving the procedural time. So this is a summary of the state of play across Europe in terms of DCD heart transplant experience. And this is as of October. So there may be a few more cases since. Um, and you can see that UK started followed by uh, Liège in Belgium and then Brussels. Uh, Vienna started in 2019, Spain in 2020, and Netherlands 
2021. And in the right-hand three columns, you'll see the technique that have been used in different countries. And as I mentioned, only three countries currently uh, are doing TANRP for heart retrieval. But in total, uh, Europe has, a, has over experienced over 200 DCT heart transplants and nearly 100 TANRP heart retrievals. So I'm going to wrap up here. In, in summary, I think it's very clear to us that donation of circulatory death provides additional hearts for transplantation. And it allows patients and people who die but do not fulfill brain death criteria, uh, we allow them to donate their organs and we can honor their wishes. TNLP, in, in our experience, has been clinically very effective and very cost effective because it only the, the, what we use is equivalent to a portable ECMO circuit, or if you're in a center that already has cardiopulmonary bypass for cardiac surgery, we could even use a standard cardiopulmonary bypass circuit in the region of six, 800 euros, compared with using machine perfusion. Machine perfusion, at the moment, there's only one machine available, and that's the transmitting organ care system, which cost about 60 to 80,000 euro per case for disposable. So there's a huge cost difference between using TNRP and machine perfusion. But of course, we need to uh, observe that there are different legal and ethical frameworks in different countries, and we need to respect those differences and make sure that we don't contravene uh, these important uh, guidelines. So thank you very much for attention. Um, that's a quick run through of TNRP for DCD heart retrieval. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. This was a very interesting presentation. And um, I thought maybe we could uh, take uh, some questions right now. And uh, I, um, Yes. Now, the first question that I would like to ask you is from a perfusionist point of view. How many perfusionists are involved when you go out and retrieve hearts in that way? Is that enough to have one person? Do you need two persons? And how does the training look like? Is it the sort of the perfusionist that is on call and that is doing normal cardiac work? Or do you need a specific training to perform these procedures together with the cardiac surgeon? Okay, that's a good question. Of course, when we first started, uh, we we had qualified perfusionists um, that go with us, and they very much went on the, because it was partly a research project. So it was very much a professional interest and involvement in our research program. At the same time as we were doing this TNRP, more and more abdominal teams are also starting to use the abdominal only NLP. And most centers now only have one perfusionist running NLP or TNLP uh, because once the, the patient or the donor has been cannulated, running the machine at four or five liters a minute, trying to correct the acid base and, and all of those things is what they would do in any sort of urgent cardiac case anyway. So from the surgical and perfusionist point of view, this is almost like um, um, massaging someone onto cardiopulmonary bypass and do a rapid cannulation and running bypass. So most centers would manage with one perfusionist. Does that mean that the system is much easier to use than a dedicated uh, ex vivo uh, perfusion machine? Um, they are very different. I think the training requirement is very different. I think for mo for any perfusionist, um, the the for example, we we now routinely use the cardio help system uh, for TNLP. But instead of the the standard circuit, um, uh, Mackey actually produces a uh, circuit for cardio help with a hard shell reservoir bolted on top of the um, oxygenator. So this is like a, a mini bypass circuit with a hard shell reservoir. Um, and the uh, cardio help system, of course, is very easy to run. Um, there's not much you can control. 
Um, and so it's really just making sure that there is enough volume and then do periodic sampling uh, and correcting the acid base. Um, and so that for most perfusioners that requires minimal additional training. On the other hand, running the transmetic organ care system, I think requires um, quite a lot of extra training. Um, and in our center, we actually do not um, ask perfusioners to run the transmetic organ care system. That's actually uh, very much a nurse led program uh, because we don't have enough perfusioners to be on call for this and for that as well. So we actually train our nurse practitioners to run the transmetic organ care system. Thank you very much. Uh, there were some questions from the chat. The first question was, do you always use a flow of five liters or does that in any way relate to the surface uh, area of the patient or the, whether the, the pressure is high enough, for example, if the patient is vasoplegic? Yeah, that's an excellent question. This is actually, um, if, if I, I don't have a slide to show you, but it's very interesting when we uh, look at the differential flow or different differentiation of cardiac output to different parts of the body. And when we do TNLP, uh, we perfuse about 65 to 70% of the um, um, vascular bed. So by excluding the brain, the skeletal muscle, uh, half the skeleton, because we do not perfuse the arms or the legs, um, we do not perfuse the pelvis, so we only perfuse about 65 to 70% of the vascular bed in the donor. And so five liters a minute is actually um, quite a lot of flow, but if possible, we would rather uh, have a higher flow because we're in a situation that we're recovering from a period of um, high pole perfusion and asystole. And of course, most of the time when we get onto um, the TNLP, starting TNLP, the lactate is routinely in the region of 15 to 18. And the, uh, the hydrogen ion, it's very low. The pH could be 6.9, 7.0. And so these are very acidotic donors. And, and uh, there is, of course, vasoplegia. And our abdominal colleagues are very nervous of using any vasoconstrictor. So we would actually prefer excess flow and um, I would, as I said, minimum five liters, if we can flow more and there is adequate volume, adequate drainage, we would flow more. So it's only when we sort of max out the flow and pressure still low that we would consider starting dopamine to try and get a bit of vascular tone. But correcting the acidosis would usually help. And, and so uh, it's a good question, but as I said, five is minimum, we would go higher if, if can, we, we can. Yes, just a very short question. Would you transfuse patients that go below an hemoglobin of 10 grams per liter? We would quite often transfuse because what we're trying to do is to optimize the environment for the heart to work because we need to restore enough blood flow and restore enough function of the heart. And then we're going to challenge the heart. Remember, you know, these donors have had a period of hypoxia could be up to 30 minutes of hypoxia and then five minutes of asystole. And it takes about, on average, about three to five minutes from knife to skin to cannulate. So there is a cumulatively multiple hits of these hearts. And after 30 to 45 minutes of reperfusion, we are loading the hearts fully and expecting them to come off TNRP and, and pump five or six liters a minute. So we want to make sure that the hemoglobin level is high enough to optimize the oxygen delivery for the myocardium. So running the hemoglobin above 100 is in preparation to wean TNRP. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your presentation and for your interesting answers to these questions that were given by the audience. Um, now, I think we'll switch over to Groningen and we'll start with a presentation of Robert Porte.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and the, and the invitation. I hope you can see my slides now. Okay. So um, I actually mo recently moved from Groningen to Rotterdam. That's why you see the Erasmus MC uh, logo instead of the uh, UMCG Groningen logo in my presentation. The other disclosure I have is that I have no financial interest in any commercial organization. And as I said, I, I recently moved from uh, the northern part of the country to from the University of Groningen to uh, the southwest to Rotterdam. Uh, what, what I would like to discuss with you in the next uh, few minutes is why do we need machine perfusion in organ transplantation? What types of machines do we have nowadays? What is the current evidence on impact uh, of machine perfusion on clinical outcome and, and transplant practice? What future developments uh, uh, do we expect? And then uh, Rutger Groothuis, who is from Groningen, actually, uh, together with him, we started a new training course on organ uh, perfusionists uh, because we, we think that the clinical perfusionists, um, uh, you, you guys are excellent in maintaining patients uh, on cardiopulmonary bypass, on ECMO, or limb perfusions, maybe sometimes. But organ perfusion is a young uh, subspecialty. Um, and, it, and it is a different technology and it actually, as I will show you in my presentation, varies from organ to organ uh, and requires additional training. So the, the greatest challenge, as was already mentioned by the previous speaker in organ transplantation today is the, the lack of suitable organs. Um, and, and transplant surgeons have been pushing the limits by performing living donor kidney transplants, liver transplants, by splitting liver so that we can transplant two recipients simultaneously or sequentially, but also by accepting more compromised or so-called extended criteria, donor livers or kidneys or hearts or lungs that in the past would not have been, not have been acceptable. Uh, but but due, to the, uh, due to the organ shortage, uh, uh, we work and the, and, the, and the increasing waiting list, we have been um, uh, confronted uh, and, and, and pushed um, to accept those, those donor organs as well. Uh, and now we see an increase in donor age, uh, more and more DCD, uh, which was already nicely explained by the previous uh, speaker. And I think DCD donation, for example, in the country uh, where I live in the Netherlands is almost up to 60% of all uh, post-mortal donors. And the same is almost, uh, I think now true in, in the UK and in Belgium. Uh, the problem is that static cold storage, the traditional way that we can preserve and transport organs for donation from the donor hospital to the transplant center, uh, has been good enough for traditional good quality organs. But now that we are confronted with more and more suboptimal organs from uh, uh, not, not so healthy patients and all the patients, so to speak, or donors, as must say, uh, we know that the static, static cold storage is not good enough because it's associated with, with substantial ischemia reperfusion injury that's causing additional damage to those already injured organs, uh, resulting in, um, in uh, uh, suboptimal or unacceptably low outcome after the transplant procedure. So we need methods to reduce preservation injury, especially ischemia reperfusion injury, and we need methods to increase the number of transplantable organs. And for that, we need viability assessment because now literally the, 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 the organ is in a box. We cannot assess it. We can only look at it from, from the outside, but during transportation uh, and preservation, which can be up to hours, of course, uh, the, 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 the viability of the organ may decrease. Uh, and we have no tool at the moment to increase, to assess the function uh, a, a few minutes before the transplant. And finally, we should uh, develop a platform to improve organs that, that all are pre-injured. Uh, for example, from a DCD, DCD donor that already suffered a degree of warm ischemia uh, to improve them uh, before we are going to accept them for transplantation. And finally, uh, uh, there is now a need for extending the preservation time. Sometimes there is logistical problems in a transplant center most of the transplants historically are done uh, at nighttime because many donors come available in the evening um, uh, and organs are, are shipped to the transplant center and transplants should be started immediately. But um, 
we all know that this is not very sustainable for a lot of people. It's not good for your health to work in the middle of the night. Uh, and it would be preferable to, to do the transplants at daytime, uh, 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 but also to have a platform where we can keep organs vital outside the human body for maybe up to days to improve their function and to treat them. And I will come back to that at the end of my presentation. So this was already briefly discussed uh, by the previous speaker. There's actually two types of machine perfusion in the field of transplant surgery, in situ or ex situ. In situ started with normal thermic regional abdominal perfusion, has now extended to the chest as well with thoracic abdominal normal thermic regional perfusion. It's only used uh, in DCD donation, whereas ex situ, after you uh, either with a rapid procurement or a traditional uh, in a brain dead donor, more uh, slower uh, procurement, uh, you, you take the liver or the kidney, the heart or whatever out. You put it on the pump, uh, excite you uh, either uh, either for transportation or at the donor at the recipient hospital after um, after statical storage and traditional uh, preservation. Now the 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 whole uh, concept behind excite you machine perfusion of donor organs is that we know that the quality of an organ uh, diminishes during static cold storage, and if you would put this graphically in a cartoon. The ideal donor graft will start at a certain point of viability, but this slowly diminishes during ischemia in the box with ice. And at some point, that organ will reach a quality that is no longer safe to transplant. Uh, then we have the ECD, the extended criteria, or the DCD, livers or kidneys or whatever, that start already at a lower level because they suffered from warm ischemia. So they, they reach that, that dotted red line earlier and reach that level uh, of being not acceptable for transplantation earlier. And what machine perfusion does is try to raise this bar to increase, extend preservation time, to gain time, to diminish the decay and the ischemic injury. Um, and at some point, you can also say, I do it end ischemically. So after transportation, you start perfusion in your transplant center. You can also gain uh, 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 time there but also, as I'll show you in a minute, you can reduce IR injury, ischemia, reperfusion injury, when you do the transplant in the recipient by first perfusing organs before you're going to implant them. The ultimate goal will be to improve organs. I think at this moment with the current technology, we cannot say that we can improve organs before transplantation ex situ, but I think in the near future, we will be able to do this with more advanced technology. If, you, if we go by all the different machines that are currently uh, commercially available, they have all been developed uh, in R&D, uh, uh, university labs, et cetera, over the, over the last decade or two. The first organ that was most extensively tested and, and, uh, and researched is the kidney, where portable devices are, are available. Actually, the, the, the technology used for ex situ kidney perfusion is rather simple. It is usually not actively oxygenated. So it only uh, contains a pump, uh, a reservoir for the kidney, and a closed circuit. Uh, most of those kidney perfusion devices are portable. Um, and for example, in the Netherlands, it's, it's a routine uh, practice to put the kidney in the donor hospital on the pump for transportation uh, and ship it to the transplant center. The, the next step would be to add an oxygenator that requires oxygen, of course, also an active oxygenation of the perfusion fluid. And there is now increasing evidence that especially for the DCD and ECD kidneys, this has additional benefit because cold uh, oxygenation uh, uh, preserves the mitochondria and avoids the ROS production, the radical oxygen species production after warm, subsequent warm reperfusion. But we can also do normal thermic machine perfusion of kidneys. This is now mostly done in the transplant center. So after static cold storage during transportation or so-called back to base machine perfusion. Um, to be honest, the evidence that this is beneficial and that you can truly uh, assess the function of a kidney, because obviously when you uh, increase the temperature back to body temperature, the, the kidney uh, metabolism will start running again. But at the moment, uh, there are 
no good viability tools yet to say that this should be standard of care for, for kidneys that we don't trust and we first want to assess before we transplant them. But there's a lot of research ongoing in this field. This, the, the other organ I want to mention are the lungs. Uh, we call that EVLP or Excitu ventilated machine perfusion. This can be done uh, from donor to the recipient. So uh, from the donor hospital on a transportable device to the, to the, to the transplant center, but also uh, as is done in the Netherlands after traditional static cold storage back to base in the transplant center alone. It's mainly used to assess the function. So here uh, it is mainly used to, um, uh, to get rid of pulmonary edema, to improve uh, ventilation of the lung, to assess the lung for a few hours, excite you before the final decision is made to accept those lungs uh, for transplantation or not. For the heart, uh, a lot of us has been said already by the previous speaker, um, if heart uh, machine perfusion is used, it's mostly in the context of DCD donation, where obviously the heart has suffered warm ischemia like all the, uh, all the other organs. And if you don't use NRP, or even in combination with NRP, uh, currently normothermic, but also hypothermic uh, machine perfusion for the heart, mostly with portable devices. So from the donor hospital to the recipient center it, it is uh, currently used. But all the, all the machines have a have very common uh, um, uh, principle with a pump and an oxygenator and a reservoir for the fluid. For the liver, it's a bit more complex because there is at least five different companies with five different systems uh, available on the market right now. Uh, first of all, there is portable devices, the three that I show over here, uh, either with cold and uh, non-oxygenated machine perfusion. To be honest, I think this is already old fashioned because there is now ample evidence for the liver that even if you do cold machine perfusion, it, 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 uh, you need oxygen, you need active oxy oxygenation to, uh, to support the liver and to protect the mitochondria. But um, you can also do normothermic machine perfusion with a blood base. Obviously, in, in normothermic machine perfusion, you need, you need an oxygen carrier, which is not necessarily needed uh, in hypothermic conditions. Um, but usually people use red blood cells uh, adding to the perfusate to, uh, to, uh, to, to maintain normothermic machine perfusion. Uh, compared to uh, 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 machine perfusion of the liver during transportation, you can also do it back to base in the transplant center. So use the simple static cold storage in the box with ice for transportation. And then it's been used for either hypothermic oxygenated machine perfusion, mostly used in the literature or abbreviated in the literature as HOPE or DHOPE. You, the liver obviously has dual blood supply by the portal vein and by the hepatic artery. The evidence is, is not uh, great that either one is better. So you can perfuse the liver either uh, via the portal vein alone or via the artery and the portal vein. And there is no major differences in benefits, but there is a huge benefit if it comes to protection of hepatocytes and especially cholangiocytes. So the biliary epithelial cells that, that line the bile duct. And those are the cells type of the liver that are most susceptible to ischemia, reperfusion, injury, and subsequent uh, uh, complications after the transplant. Uh, in contrast to hypothermic oxygenated machine perfusion, you can also end ischemically do normothermic machine perfusion. There are several devices for that uh, are commercially available now. And that's mainly used actually to assess the function of a liver where you have doubts uh, about the quality uh, 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 based on the donor characteristics. Uh, and then finally, the two combinations have been linked together by a protocol that, that has been developed in the Netherlands, in Groningen, where we start with cold perfusion to resuscitate the mitochondria, to restore ATP, to avoid the ischemia reperfusion injury, which you would see in warm reperfusion, then do slow rewarming during controlled oxygenated rewarming or core, and then finally reach body temperature where the liver reaches uh, uh, 37 degrees and starts making, producing bile and clearing lactate, et cetera, and you can assess the function. That is probably the safest but most complex uh, technique for very compromised livers that in the past were all declined for transplantation. And with it, this technology, we have seen a 20% increase in the number of livers that were accepted for transplantation uh, that would have been 
uh, in the past denied for transplantation because of a very high risk donor profile. Uh, so there's definitely uh, a, a, a rise of machines in transplantation surgery. Uh, it's rapidly entering also the clinical arena and being accepted in various hospitals, but it's certainly not new because it's already in 1934 that Charles Lindbergh and Alexis Carell uh, started experimenting uh, with excitu organ perfusion with a device actually that has led to, uh, to a prototype of a heart-lung machine uh, in those years. And actually the principles that those two gentlemen um, uh, researched and, and studied are still used today in heart-lung machines, but also in excitu or inside you machine perfusion of uh, donor organs. So but a few more words about the liver, because I, I am mainly a liver transplant surgeon. Uh, as I said already, uh, static cold storage, not good enough for ECD, DCD livers. And with machine perfusion, there is now increasing scientific evidence that we can improve outcome. We can avoid ischemia reperfusion related complications, such as mainly clangiopathy or bowel duct complications. I already said that the bowel ducts are most susceptible to ischemia reperfusion injury uh, in the liver, but we can also increase the number of transplantable uh, livers. And, 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 and last but not least, we can facilitate logistics. We have done combined lung liver transplants, heart liver transplants from the same donor sequentially in the same recipient uh, that was facilitated by, 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 um, by doing it sequentially and putting the liver on the pump first before the, the lungs or the, kid or, or the heart transplant was already completed. And then you avoid additional cold uh, ischemic injury to that second organ before it's going to transplant it. Uh, a, a, an example of cold liver perfusion, the liver is upside down positioned in a reservoir. Here you see cannulation of the artery or actually the supertruncal aorta, the portal vein for dual perfusion, uh, either at hypothermic conditions or at normal thermal condition. And obviously then you need red blood cells for adequate uh, oxygen delivery. Uh, the great thing about a cold oxygenated machine perfusion is that we now know that if you do a machine perfusion after static cold storage, so after you bring the liver to your transplant center and you do it normal thermically immediately, the liver will, uh, will experience all the, um, the, the ischemia reperfusion injury with injury of the mitochondria, with reversed electron flow in the mitochondria, subsequent ROS production, as you would have seen if you would have transplanted that, that liver in a, in a recipient. Uh, but if you do first cold hypothermic uh, oxygenated machine perfusion before the warm one, uh, for some reason, the mitochondria can, can, can uh, handle and can utilize oxygen in a more slow fashion with restoration of ATP, with restoration of the normal electron flow in a forward direction, uh, with no rust or very minimal rust production and all the, the negative sequelae that come from that. Uh, and that was also proven in large randomized controlled European trial that we led from the Groningen Institute, where the main focus was DCT liver transplantation, patients donor livers were randomized for static cold storage alone, or for only two hours of cold dual hypothermic machine perfusion. And the primary endpoint was biliary complications or non anastomotic biliary strictures. And I already mentioned that that is the, the, um, the cell type or the, the part of the liver that's most susceptible to ischemia reperfusion injury uh, that was significantly re reduced in that trial by 68%, but also secondary outcome like post reperfusion syndrome or the hemodynamic instability after graft reperfusion in the recipient was reduced by more than 50%. Uh, and the same is for the biochemical evidence of early allograft dysfunction in the first week after the transplant, that was reduced by almost 40% by a simple technique, only two hours of cold oxygenated machine perfusion uh, before you go and implant the liver. So it can be done during the recipient hepatectomy. A more advanced, Method I already mentioned is normal term machine perfusion. Very similar results actually in the large European Oxford led uh, trial, 220 regular liver transplants. Unfortunately, in this trial, no significant difference, difference on biliary complications, but this, this trial uh, uh, also included DBD donors, so not only DCD donors, so the 
overall incidence is also lower in that type of liver transplantation. Um, and, um, but there was a, a, an impact on ischemia reperfusion injury related complications in favor of the normal thermic machine preservation study. Now, the great thing I, I already mentioned about normal thermic machine perfusion is that the liver is metabolically active. If you cannulate the bile duct, you will see bile flow and bile is a very good um, uh, substance to measure uh, uh, liver function, but also bile duct injury is beyond the scope of this presentation. But nowadays we do point of care uh, biochemical analysis of bile samples that we collect during machine perfusion to assess the histological integrity of the bile ducts. Uh, and that is a very strong selection tool nowadays uh, to select uh, donor livers, especially from DCD donors that have suffered warm ischemia in the donor. So in the Netherlands, if you talk about liver transplantation, the current scheme is that the traditional good quality DBD livers are transplanted after static cold storage alone. There's no need to do machine perfusion here. The regular DCD livers based on the New England paper and the trial, we give them two hours of cold perfusion before we implant them. The same is true sometimes for logistical reasons or for compromised DBD livers or split procedures where we put, put the liver on the pump for splitting and then transplanting it into two patients. And, and then if there is concern about the viability of the liver uh, or the bile ducts, and we want to assess that first before we make the decision to accept that liver, we warm them up on the pump to normal thermic condition in the DOP core and the P protocol here shown uh, in the right lower corner. And then we can functionally assess the liver before we make that final call or discard the liver if it's not good enough. So we are at the forefront, I think, of a very exciting time. This is a nice review paper that I encourage you to read in Artificial Organs, where the researchers or the, 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 the authors have described the future of better using this platform, not only to avoid ischemia reperfusion injury and to improve outcome, but also to, to really improve organs by CRISPR-Cas technology. Xenotransplantation may now become uh, more uh, a, a reality, um, but also uh, maybe uh, chimeric uh, uh, modification of organs to make them already a little bit more self before you transplant them to improve outcomes. I think that is not lo no longer science fiction that may be realistic. And But the machine perfusion, we have a platform for chemically or, or medically interfering with organs, with treating them with synalytics, with stem cell therapy. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the options are numerous to really improve organs and keep them outside the human body for a longer period of time before you're going to transplant them. And the most successful case is now already with liver preservation for up to a week outside the human body in, a, in an animal model and three days uh, in a clinical case that was published by the Zurich group uh, outside the human body. And I think we can now even go up to a month uh, to preserve a liver uh, outside the human body to really modify it before we can transplant it. So if you put this in a time schedule, we, we, this was all developed in the research phase with a lot of students and researchers. Now it's coming in more and coming to in, in the clin clinical implementation phase. Uh, more and more centers are embarking on machine perfusion in, in transplant surgery. Uh, but what we also see that we need dedicated people for this that want to uh, uh, pursue a career in organ perfusion. Uh, that's why I think to advance the field further, we need dedicated uh, professional organ perfusionists, uh, but also dedicated facility. And, and I think in the Netherlands, we are lucky that we have uh, both in, in Groningen and in Rotterdam dedicated organ uh, preservation and resuscitation units, part of the OR complex, where we can simultaneously perfuse livers, lungs, and kidneys to the back table. But we need, we need the people to, to run those devices. So that's what the, the next uh, speaker will talk about. We need to train them. In summary, machine perfusion is rapidly changing organ transplantation practice. For now, we can achieve less ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, we can assess function, but we cannot yet improve organ quality before transplantation. That will be the next step uh, when we can advance developing this platform further. But we need uh, professions for this because this is now coming from the research uh, area into uh, more clinical practice. 
and that's where the organ perfusionist or the more specialized clinical perfusionist I think uh, uh, has, has to fill a, ro a role. That was my last slide. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. My email address is here. And I'll be happy to, uh, to be in touch with you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Porte, for this most interesting presentation on future possibilities for perfusionists. Now, in the chat, there was some discussion about who should be the person who does the organ perfusion, whether that should be a dedicated person or, uh, or a perfusionist who is working in the cardiac department. Uh, how is the situation at your department right now? Is it is it dedicated people that are only doing organ perfusion or are they perfusionists that work in any field of perfusion? Well, like I said, this this is just coming out of the clinic, out of out of the research. And as of January uh, last year, it, it, we now have funding from from the insurance companies uh, to the, for the large transplant centers to appoint a dedicated perfusionist. Most of those perfusionists were coming from the research, so were um, uh, 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 technical medical doctors. But now we have seen also an increasing interest from clinical perfusionists. So we are collaborating. So now the team that we have in Rotterdam is a mixture of clinical perfusionists and more dedicated uh, 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 transplant organ perfusionists. Some of them also combine it with a PhD uh, research project because there is still a lot to research. So it's a combination of researchers uh, and, and uh, established clinical perfusionists and also dedicated organ perfusionists. Yeah. Well, I suspect that in the future, when you have large programs running with organ perfusion, that the knowledge of all the systems and everything would be too complicated for a person to, to have when he's working in the cardiac surgical department on a regular basis. Uh, what do you think? I think it depends on the volume of your transplant center. If you are in a large transplant center where different types of organs are transplanted and you have different types of machines, it pays off to have a dedicated person. That can also be a clinical perfusionist who switches gears a little bit and and and, and gets uh, trained for organ perfusion specifically. Um, I, I think to do everything, to do heart-lung machine, to do ECMO, to do limb perfusion and also organ perfusion in your career at the same time it's probably too much because you, you it's difficult to keep up with the quality and uh, uh, and have enough experience. But uh, it may differ from, from center to center, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we switch over. We take another effort to actually switch to Groningen and we'll ask Rutger Grothus to give his presentation. Yes, good evening, everyone. And thanks for the invitation. I will share my screen. So it's a pleasure to uh, inform you about our first international educational program for the organ perfusionist. And um, as you have noticed already, maybe it's, it's getting busy in our OPR and, and that's the, um, the result of a growing need for machine perfusion. And um, so are, we are expanding and we are expanding in facilities, but also in people. And last year we have uh, uh, opened our second OPR unit already in, uh, in Groningen. And at the moment um, we have 25 organ perfusionists working in the Netherlands and 10 of them are working in Groningen. And they have a background in technical medicine, biomedical en engineering, biomedical sciences or clinical perfusion. And sometimes they combine their professions uh, as Robert already uh, noticed. Uh, and their main tasks are donor acceptance, uh, what's quite new, the first one, uh, and machine pres preservation, perfu perfusion, of course, and research. So um, the number of perfusions in Groningen in total, we have um, conducted over 70, uh, 70 EVLPs, so lung perfusions, uh, three NMPs, kidney NMPs, 
over uh, 90, over 100 D-Hope, liver D-Hope perfusions and uh, 92 D-Hope core NMPs and five hearts at the moment DCDs. So um, machine perfusion is growing and um, to anticipate on it, this, uh, you have to uh, organize a good infrastructure in your hospital. But you also have to share your knowledge. You have to be part of a worldwide community um, to, to develop and, and grow um, or, um, with each other. But at last, and, um, um, and I think that's the most important, is that we see the organ perfusionist as an own profession, as a dedicated, certified professional. And to realize this, um, we have developed our international educational program. So th this new expert, what, what does he need to know and needs to uh, do? Well, a lot of things, and um, um, in, in, you can see here a, a small overview of skills and knowledge uh, the organ perfusionist has to uh, know and has to be capable of. And before we start the program, um, uh, we, we um, developed uh, and trustable uh, professional activities with a group of surgeons and, and other relevant experts to uh, determine these, uh, uh, these, these competences of this new expert. And we've divided the information, the information and their competences in, 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 and their knowledge in, in need to know and nice to know. And based on that, we've made our theoretical program um, with a duration of one year, and it contains 215 theoretical hours, 14 online course days, free hands-on skills week, which are divided over the year, and a practical learning program in um, the own center of the student, which is still in development. Um, so we have a, a few general sections they start, where the students start with, uh, like organ donation, physiology, biomechanics, and um, uh, normal thermic regional perfusion. And after that, they, after that, they will follow some organ specific sections like liver, lung, kidney, and heart perfusion with a fixed structure of chapters, as you can see below. Um, and be, uh, prior to the online course days, there's a lot of e-learning and um, uh, the, the students has uh, go through and uh, to evaluate their and, and, and to prepare their knowledge. And the hands-on skills weeks are three in total. In the first week, we have the, we focus on the basic knowledge. And in the second and the third, uh, third week, more on the perfusion protocol, the strategies, uh, things like troubleshooting, etc. And it's located in uh, Groningen and Rotterdam. So this is a small impression of our uh, physical, uh, of our hands-on skills weeks in the first class. And the practical program, as I already told you, is still in development. But based on the professional activities we have developed, we try to um, um, expand this in, 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 the, in, in the transplant centers in the Netherlands. And we hope to expand it also in, in the transplant centers uh, in Europe and even, maybe even worldwide, that based on a portfolio uh, everyone can um, um, yeah, maintain their competences. So um, unfortunately, our uh, course for this year is fully booked, but um, please go to uh, organperfusion.nl or email us to keep informed for the next course in uh, January 2024. So that was about it. I will and my sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Rutger. There, uh, I think that was the most interesting for, uh, thing for me was to see how much perfusion is developing. Um, many years ago, we only had clinical perfusionists working on the hot lung machine. And then there was a great number of perfusionists doing ECMO and related stuff, and now the new development of organ perfusion, which is getting on in a greater scale. And that's very interesting to see. 
Um, there were some people commenting in the chat about these topics, but I think uh, Robert had his hand raised. And would you like to comment, Robert? Yeah, I, I saw those comments in the chat as well, and I can I can fully understand. But this is not a replacement. We are not trying to replace. It just it is a new type of perfusion that has emerged from research and entered the clinical arena. It's the first time actually that clinical most clinical perfusionists became aware of this. And in the Netherlands, we are very closely collaborating with the clinical perfusionists. They are active in NRP, they're active in EVOP, in lung perfusion, they're active in the establishment of this, this training course that Rutger just summarized. Uh, so it's a very, it's a very uh, tight uh, collaboration. At the same time, most clinical perfusionists are extremely busy with cardiothoracic surgery, etc. And they say, if we have to embark on an additional activity and support all the transplant activities as well, we don't have enough personnel. So I think it, we should focus on training additional people. Even experienced clinical perfusionists may not know how to perfuse an isolated liver and to how to assess the physiology of an isolated liver. Uh, so they also need additional training. But of course, they have a much um, they have more experience already and have a lot of background knowledge already to do this quicker than somebody who starts from scratch. But we should do this together. So it's not them against us. It's, it's us together, including clinical perfusionists that have to develop this further. Yes, uh, I certainly agree with your comments. And I think it's uh, very important to understand that this is a new field and whoever feels that he, uh, this is something for them, then they should start working on it. And and obviously it's a complicated arena and there's a lot of research involved. So it means that you have to dedicate yourself to this work. And uh, But the clinical perfusionist is in an excellent position to take up this and uh, show his interest and start working in these arenas. And I think that's uh, very positive and very interesting. And it also has implications for the perfusion schools, of course, because if a substantial number of uh, people that have had education in perfusion schools go on to dedicated organ perfusion, then they will need to learn about this in their training. So are you collaborating with the perfusion school in uh, the Netherlands or how, how is that organized? There we are. We yeah. are. Yeah. We are very yes, good. We Thank are uh, co collaborating with them, and and based on their entrustable pro professional activities, we also um, developed our ones so that they're um, um, fixed on uh, or that they um, um, uh, fixed on each other, and they yeah. So we we are definitely working with them together. Yes. Yo. Thank, uh, thank you, everybody, for a very interesting evening. And I think that we will now close this session and that people that would like to come into contact with either of the speakers, they would uh, be in a position to write an email and then receive an answer, hopefully. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.